Hi, thanks for joining me today. Gary Zacharias here with the Apologist Bookshelf. I'm going to two podcasts a week now, so I hope you uh, heard that already. And uh, feel free to go back over others that I've uh, done in the past. And uh, I hope this will reach more people and give you more things to think about. I've got a book here that uh, I've not talked about before. It's Hank Hanegraaff's book called Resurrection. And probably a lot of you know about Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man. Uh, he, he's moved from evangelical to Eastern Orthodox, which is interesting. So I won't get into that now. Uh, that's too big an area. But I was just looking at the reaction to people who have read Resurrection. Uh, Josh McDowell uh, compliments him. Uh, Gary Habermas, Norm Geisler, J.P. Moreland, Philip Johnson, Max Licato, Greg Laurie, David Jeremiah, John MacArthur, John Maxwell, um, see if I got some others, Rick Warren, Lee Strobel. So uh, the, he's got a really great book out here, and it deals with all sorts of things to do with the resurrection. And you think it'd all be just, you know, what do you think heaven will be like, kind of a, an abstract thing. But I like the way he structured the book. First is he defends the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, you know, the way Hank Hanegraaff has done things in the past, he does them here. He uses acronyms. So he does a defense of the resurrection of Christ with the word feet, F-E-A-T, F for fatal torment. In other words, that Jesus really did die, E for the empty tomb, A for the appearances of Christ, and T for the transformation of the disciples. So that's an easy, easy way to remember uh, reasons why we believe the resurrection really happened to Jesus. And then the second part of his book is a defense of the resurrection of creation. And then the third part is answers. He is a Bible answer man. So he has definitive answers to questions regarding resurrection. Things like, was Christ's physical body resurrected from the dead or did he rise in immaterial spirit? You know, some groups say immaterial. How about the soul? Does it exist after the death of the body? Well, that's one of the chapters I'd like to look at. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, do believers receive resurrected bodies when they die or when Christ returns? And here's one I've heard before. In fact, I thought about that when I was young. If heaven is perfect, won't it be perfectly boring? You know, you see all those little cartoon pictures of people sitting around on clouds. They've got harps. I thought, wow, that's it? That's what you do? Of course, he has a much different answer <laughs> than that. Uh, one chapter is uh, on animals. Is God going to raise pets? from the dead. And then I want to do another chapter. I'm going to do two of them because these are fairly short. Reincarnation. Is that uh, exclusive from resurrection or can you blend the two together somehow? A chapter on cremation. A chapter on age. You know, what, what age would we be when we get resurrected? A chapter on sex. Would there be sex after the resurrection? A chapter on rewards. What about rewards? And then I like what he's got at the end here. He has three appendices and that, are, that give you a lot more detail that tells you a scripture index, subject index, and then I really like his bibliography. It's like 12 pages or something like that. A lot of good information. So, like I said, I think because of uh, time limitation, I am going to just stick to a couple of his chapters today. So here's chapter 10. Does the soul continue to exist after the death of the body? And I've done a talk on that myself and found that fascinating because, of course, if we have no soul, then it's all pointless, isn't it? Um, we live, we die, and we rot, and that's that. So he starts off and he said, there are several reasons he finds compelling that we do have an immaterial part of our being that transcends the material and that goes on after this life. So number one, he says, the mind is not identical to the brain, that the mind and brain had different properties. J. Warner Wallace gets into that some with his book, uh, God's Crime Scene. So the mind and the brain have different properties. What does that mean? Well, he says, when you feel pain or you experience sound or you're aware of color, that's different than something that's physical. I mean, if the world was only made of matter, he says, these subjective aspects of consciousness wouldn't exist. He said, just think about it. He, he takes color as an example. You think about that. When you experience color, it's way more than just a wavelength of light, isn't it? You feel good or you feel bad or it reminds you of something or it puts you in a particular mood, but it's not just a wavelength of light. It goes on from a legal perspective, perspective of humans, we're only material. 
then why would you hold them accountable for a crime committed some time ago? Because physical identity changes over time. Good land. All I have to do is look in a mirror and see how much you know we change. We're the, we're the same person inside, but we look differently on the outside. And he said, every day we lose millions of little microscopic particles. And his claim is that every seven years, roughly, our entire material anatomy changes. He says, maybe not some of our neurological system, but from a purely material perspective, if you say we're just matter, then the self who did the crime in the past is not literally the same person who's present at the time of punishment. So, of course, anybody tries to use that line of reasoning, line of defense in a trial is uh, going to be laughed at. Here's a third reason he said we believe we have souls. If we were just material beings then we'd have no free will. We'd be full of a, a, just a mechanistic material process that goes on inside of us. We'd just be molecules in motion. We'd just be uh, surging hormones or we'd be chemicals. Uh, he said, if I'm ma merely material, this Hank Hanegraaff talking, my choices are merely a function of things like my genetic makeup and brain chemistry. So he says everything is fatalistically determined. Well, we don't believe that. And he said, if you believe it, if you think you're totally determined, then why would you be held morally accountable for your actions? Think about our whole system of reward and punishment. That only makes sense if we have freedom of the will. So the very concept of love. Here's another example of this. If we don't have free will, then love is rendered meaningless. It's just a robotic, robotic procedure. It's just determined by physical processes. So, first he says, non-physical aspects of humanity, like the ego, exist. Secondly, he said, we have a sameness inside, even though our physical identity changes. And then finally he says, we do believe we have freedom, we're more than material robots. And he said, we can go on. He said, I, presented, I can present additional arguments, like, how about this one? There's great design out there in the universe, he takes an example of the fertilized egg and how organized and complex that is. He talks about photons that hit the eye, and, and it's not some simple process that happens. It's involved biochemical processes. And he says the Earth has great precision, precision and design. He has a quotation from an astronaut, Guy Gardner, who's been up, um, up in space. He said, the more we learn and see about our universe the more we come to realize that the most ideally suited place for life within the entire solar system is the planet we call home. And he said, something like our planet has to have a cause greater than itself. And so we've got all this organized complexity of the world and our lives uh, inside of us and our personalities. That's, that's amazing. He said, design requires a designer. And that's what you don't get when it comes to materialistic evolution. Something can't come from nothing. And then he says, here's a problem. Philosophical naturalism, the idea that evolution explains everything and that everything is just the natural world and that's all there is. How do they explain the existence of the universe? Well, they've only got really three choices, Hanegraaff says. The first is that the universe is just an illusion. Well, nobody buys into that. The second is the universe sprang from nothing. Yeah, but you've got the law of cause and effect. How do you verify that? How do you believe that happened? Pretty unlikely. The third is that the universe eternally existed. Well, they've, they've really, scientists have really come down strongly on the idea of a beginning to the universe. You have the law of entropy. I mean, that predicts that a universe would have died a long, long time ago from heat loss. But he says, you know, there's a fourth possibility. Look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, that seems to be certain, clear, and correct. And of course, he says, uh, you've got the resurrection of Jesus. There's another reason to believe that there's a soul. And he mentions that F-E-A-T, uh, the fatal torment and the appearances of Christ and the empty tomb and the transformation. So um, he, I think he does a really good job in that chapter as far as why do we believe we have a soul. Like I said, I researched it, and he's hit some of the real main points along in there, too. So let me pick up on one more chapter. Uh, we've got the time. I want to look at uh, chapter 14, which talks about reincarnation. 
So his uh, subtitle, his question is, are reincarnation and resurrection mutually exclusive? And he said, for millions of Buddhists and Hindus and Sikhs and Jains, reincarnation is just as predictable and just as real as the law of gravity. And he says, of course, in the West, in the Western world, we believe in the resurrection. But he said there was a huge paradigm shift that started in 1893. Buddhists and Baha'is and uh, yogis from the East came to Chicago, and there was the world's first, it was called World's Parliament of Religion, of Religion, sorry. And they were outnumbered by Bible believers. But they got into the West and they started spreading their ideas. And a hundred years later, they had a centennial celebration of the original Parliament of Religions. This is now in 1993. He said, Buddhists now outnumbered Baptists. He said there were more saffron robes than clerical clothing. So that message, the, the message that had been out there for a hundred years coming from the East, he says it was cleverly repackaged for Western consumption. But the idea of pantheism, reincarnation, became a big deal. And he mentioned some people who buy into that. And I won't spend a lot of time why they buy into it, but he gives the example of Glenn Ford, the actor, Loretta Lynn, the singer, Shirley MacLaine, yes, we all know about her, and even Sylvester Stallone. Now, I didn't know that, and I probably would want to check on that, but he's got some quotations from Stallone there. Then Hanegraaff cites some polls that have been done by the Gallup organization. A whopping 23% of Americans, now this is like 20 years ago, had begun to put their faith in reincarnation. That's a fourth of Americans. And even the Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics says approximately one in four Americans believe in reincarnation. And if you're talking about college students, college-age young people, that's about one in three. Wow. And then here's a sad one. One in five who attend church regularly also believe in reincarnation. One in five? Really? He says it's so sad. Some people say there's ways that you can harmonize reincarnation with a Christian worldview. Uh, and they, they take certain Bible passages. He mentions three here. Jeremiah, John, and then something Jesus said. In Jeremiah, God allegedly tells his prophet that he knew him as a result of a prior incarnation. This is Jeremiah 1.5. Before I form, formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, what about John's gospel? Well, uh, the disciples allegedly wonder, this is John 9, they wonder whether a man who's born blind is maybe paying off karmic debt for himself or his parents. And then they mention Jesus in Matthew eleven fourteen. He seems to suggest that Elijah was reincarnated as John the Baptist. He says, absolutely not. You look at the context, and that's key, isn't it? Context, not picking a word out here or there, but look at the context of those scriptural passages. In Jeremiah, God's not saying his prophet had existed before, but that he who had existed for all eternity, that's God, preordained Jeremiah to a special task. What about John? Were the gospels, uh, where the disciples were wondering about these uh, this blind guy? Is he paying off a karmic debt? He said, no. Jesus even says that his blindness had nothing to do with his sin or his parents. And then what about Jesus himself suggesting Elijah had been reincarnated as John the Baptist? But that's dismissed as well. In John one twenty one, the priests and Levites asked John, are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. They're not two incarnations of the same person. They're two separate people who function in a strikingly similar prophetic role. And of course, Hanegraaff goes to Hebrews 9.27. It states, human beings are destined to die once. And he talks, uh, again, a few more Bible passages in Luke 16. Jesus talks about the horrors of judgment in the afterlife, not the karmic debt in another life. Paul in Romans 8 says, we await the redemption of our bodies. We're not awaiting a reincarnation into a different body. And uh, in Philippians 3, Paul says, Christ will transform our lowly bodies. And that the body that dies is the same body that rises. That's 1 Corinthians 15. So I like this. Toward the end of that section here, he has a quotation from Norm Geisler. Rather than a series of bodies that die, resurrection makes alive forever the same body that died. Rather than seeing personhood as a soul in a body, resurrection sees each human being as a soul-body unity. 
Reincarnation is a process of perfection. Resurrection is a perfected state. Reincarnation is an intermediate state while the soul longs to be disembodied and absorbed in God. But resurrection is an ultimate state in which the whole person, body and soul, enjoys the goodness of God. So I just want to take on those two chapters, the reincarnation chapter and whether we have a soul. These are issues that we're hearing from people around us. So if you'd like more depth um, in what I've been covering, it's a book called Resurrection. It's been out for some time. Hank Hanegraaff, the author. So you can probably find some used copies out there. It's really worth looking at. You may not agree with everything that Hank has to say, but he backs up with a lot of good scripture. He's always entertaining, always easy to read. All right, well, we'll do another. Uh, keep in mind again that we're going to try to do two of these podcasts a week. So thanks for listening, and we'll do another podcast soon.